uh, uh, going to be talking to us today about stroke, what we do we perfuse, and uh, some virtues about uh, TCD, um, and should it be a standard of care. So what do we perfuse? Well, we perfuse the body as a whole, right? We perfuse the arms and the legs, but you know, they could go quite a while without uh, any flow and probably do just fine. The heart, well, we use cardioplegia most of the time and stop that. Um, the kidneys, you know, they're fairly tolerant of, of low flow. Um, the liver, you know, the gut, you know, and a variety of other things. But uh, let, me, uh, let me pull up my slides here too. There we go. So there are a hundred billion stars in the Milky Way. And there are a hundred billion neurons in the human brain with over a hundred trillion synapses. Those are mind boggling, just almost incomprehensible numbers. <clears throat> well, how do we measure the adequacy of perfusion? Well, we assume a whole hell of a lot, right? We do fancy calculations. We measure SVO2. Uh, we do labs. We measure, of course, you know, the, you know as I said, the SVO2, acid-base balance, lactate level. Uh, we calculate DO2. And uh, we use cerebral oximetry. Um, and uh, these are kind of the standard tools that we use to uh, assume that we have adequate perfusion to especially the most sensitive of organs, the brain. But I want to take you kind of down a little road here and take a look and see uh, some things that are realities. Let's talk about cerebral oximetry. The concept seems quite easy. The photoplethmisogram which is basically like a pulse ox, um, is a pretty simple device, works pretty well. But up here, it's not the same as here or the earlobe or something like that. Um, the uh, making a usable device is easier said than done. And one of the big problems is how each device figures out what the saturation is coming from the skin, subcutaneous tissue, muscle, bone, and eventually the blood, which is mixed with both venous and arterial blood. In addition to all of this, each device uses a different approach for delivering light and analyzing the light being reflected back. Each device uses a different approach to compensate for the absorption of the light by the various different tissues you have to go through from going through the, the skull. The analysis algorithm in every device is different from every other device. In other words, no two devices do it the same way. No two commercial oximeters even measure the same thing and the specific algorithms that are used for most devices are kept secret. On top of all of that, they change their algorithms and technology so that a study done in, for example, 2005 may no longer be applicable 
in 2013 or 2013 to now 2018. And, and these are, you know, these are, you know, I think very controversial things to be saying because there's a lot of people that just believe in, in cerebral oximetry and are passionately uh, 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 supportive of it and try to take it away. And I mean, it's even on the STS uh, uh, database as to whether you used it or not, and if you were ever below baseline. So you have to have a baseline, but other, one company has that, another company doesn't, and they go round and round and round and round. So, but keep in mind, they all work, but to the same potentially hazardous, dangerous degree of inaccuracy. So. It's kind of like, okay, should we even be doing this? And <clears throat> is it giving us a false sense of security, misleading information? We're making clinical decisions. Sometimes it seems like it works and really works well. But is it doing that all of the time? And that's the thing. If it's only doing it half the time, how do we know? If it's doing it 90%, how do we know? Does that 10% matter? Right, let me move on from there. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of getting myself sidetracked. No device is capable of providing a pure SpO2, saturation of the brain value, no matter what the promotional material says. Let me say that one more time. No device is capable of providing a pure SpO2 value for the brain, no matter what the company selling it may say. The signal from all devices will be is contaminated by extra cerebral blood, which confounds all of what it is you're supposed to be actually looking at. And let me illustrate this for you in this diagram, which is published from the Jura, uh, Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesiology in 1996, and it is still applicable today. A living person can have a SpO2 reading anywhere within here, but this is kind of your average mean values. If we go ahead and kill you, then your reading can be in here with these being what were the mean values, but if we kill you and we remove your brain, well, you are still potentially going to get a reading. In fact, do in fact get a reading anywhere within here. So you can have a SBO2 reading of 68, 70, 72 in a preferably, hopefully, dead patient that has had their brain literally removed from their skull cavity. And if that's not enough to concern you, then, you know, I mean, so be it. But it does concern me. Stroke. There is no good stroke. Perioperative stroke rates in cardiac surgery range from 1.7 to 2.9%. For isolated cabbage, for valve, stroke rates jump to about 4.5%, somewhere between 4 and 7%, somewhere in that range. Encephalopathy rates, on the other hand, are much higher, 7.7 to 13.8%. These subtle strokes, we'll call them. They're not, you know, what's a stroke, right? You go, you know, the, they, they, the, the surgeon goes in to see their patient post-op and, you know, half of their body is paralyzed and they're, you know, uh, they don't look good. Well, we all know what a stroke is, but that's not all that's a stroke. You don't always have to have a complete hemiparesis to be having had a stroke. They're combative. They're not waking up right. They're not, you know, they're having some kind of, you know, something is happening. These are strokes. And that rate, 13.8%, that's pretty doggone high. Um, they're harder to diagnose. They're subtle. 
I talked about combativeness, and of course this results in a delay of uh, extubation and usually a prolonged um, course in the hospital. And you know, they, they're not benign, you know? I mean, look, I think as perfusionists, and I, this is, uh, I just started, June 1st, I began my 40th year as a perfusionist. And, uh, and, and I've definitely had an opportunity to see all kinds of things. I've been several different places, um, and uh, I have some pretty strong opinions, as you all may very well know, um, about how we are as a profession. I, I, and I'm not insensitive to the realities of, you know, what it's, you know, one institution compared to another and the time that we have and work-life balance and all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, do we really know the, the majority of us? Some I think yes, some I think no, some I'm not sure. Um, but do we know what really happens to our patients when we're finished treating them in the operating room? Do we really go check on them? You know, as I said, some yes, some definitely no, some I'm not really sure. I'm kind of curious, if, you know, if you want to leave me a note, I don't see the YouTube chat, but maybe later if you want to call in and we can discuss that. I think that's something that I want to discuss with my colleagues, uh, Min and Stephanie, the panel today, and uh, see what their thoughts are on that. Um, do we see the patient post-op at any time, you know, in the ICU or beyond that? Do we even know whether they got discharged from the, uh, from the hospital? Well, you know, the, uh, the answer to that really is no. You know, so I I'm, I'm going to whack us on the head, um, I think deservedly so, for those of us who don't. Um, for those of us who do, even if it's as simple as calling the surgeon up and saying, hey, how'd that case go, you know? Uh, or, or just conferring with them maybe the next time you see them and see how, they're, how the patients did. I think it's important for us to, to get more involved in that in order for us to be more included in the overall uh, 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 heart care team and, and what we do. I think, we're, I think to be a stakeholder means that you have more input in what we, uh, what we do with the uh, 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 use and how we practice and just being more involved. That's you know, what I think. But strokes are deadly. There's a threefold increase in mortality at the end of the 10 years. They are debilitating and most patients, especially older patients, would, will tell you, I, I'd rather be dead then have to live with a debilitating stroke. Um, I can understand that and I pretty much feel the same way. And I, it says the elderly, I don't consider myself elderly, but I probably am qualifying. Um, they are no longer able to maintain their independence and enjoy important activities, seeing their grandkids, going places, traveling with their with their spouses or whatever it may be that they enjoy going and playing golf, tennis, um, you know, and so forth. Um, they prefer quality over longevity, of course, decreased, and they lose cognition and mental acuity, and that's frustrating. It's almost like getting Alzheimer's, only you actually know you're not making any sense, you know, so it's in, in, in many ways worse. Um, it is incredibly expensive. In fact, for the patient, it is financially devastating. For the hospital, they're going to take a hit because you have a stroke and you know, you're treating that patient after having heart surgery. You're not making more money for it. You're not getting paid for having to take care of this patient. The hospitals are eating that cost. And then, of course, the cost to society. We're losing you know, real value that a contributing member of our society can bring because they're now, you know, no longer able to do things and they're debilitated or having to be taken care of, which then, of course, takes even more resources. So that has to get paid somewhere and by someone. And if they don't have insurance that's going to pay it, then uh, the Medicare system or the Medicaid system is going to end up um, paying, that, paying that bill. So... You know, sometime around 1990, uh, the Wall Street Journal published an article, and we learned what pump head was. First time I'd ever heard the term before was from this article, pump head. And, uh, and again, you know, it was pretty much, pretty much believed 
that the pump is in fact the cause of almost all strokes or all uh, 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 confusion or all you know, neurocognitive dysfunction or whatever we want to categorize any one particular patient's issue with. Dr. Skump, Stump, of course, uh, you know, with his SCADs and having lipids that have a film around them and they become occlusive to the microcirculation. Um, and, uh, you know, we've tried dealing with that, reducing the blood air interface. That's how the MEC system, if we remember that, you know, where they were doing, it was MEC and there was another uh, device. And I can't think of the name of it now, but these were closed loop systems. And those closed loop systems eliminated all blood air interface. You didn't use pump suckers at all. Everything went to the cell saver. Um, and many, many cases were done with it, some successfully, some with difficulty, um, but it's really never took on as, as being very popular. Um, and then, of course, the off-pump craze, because let's just do all of these coronaries off-pump, and we're going to just inc reduce incredibly the number of, of strokes that our patients are having to suffer. So then came this article, Off-Pump or On-Pump Coronary Artery Bypass Grafting, at 30 days, published in the New England Journal. It's called the coronary study, actually. And it's gonna be real interesting when we're in New Orleans because in the past, I had debated Dr. DeWitt on pump versus off pump. And everyone knows that, you know, if you don't know me, I am a strong advocate for not doing, or proponent would probably be the better way to say it, of off pump cabbage surgery, except in certain circumstances where I think it does have applicability. You know, a single vessel lima on a pristine, perfect target where you really get a, you know, a quality anastomosis. Okay, I buy that. Maybe. Still not 100%. I know surgeons who will not do a single vessel off a single vessel Lima to the LAD off pump because their philosophy is I want this is the one thing this person's here for the one thing and I want it to be absolutely perfect I don't care how good you are and there's a lot of really good surgeons out there I certainly you know give them that I tip my hat to them I don't care how good you are if the heart's still moving and it's still bleeding and you're still having to go back and forth and trying to time it to the beat, the anastomosis isn't going to be as good. So you tell me all you want, still not going to be as good. I want mine on pump. So the, the study was for over 4,700 patients, 79 sites, multi-center trial in 19 different countries, dominated really by the United States and Canada. These are the prom, uh, primary outcomes that they looked at over the first 30 days. You know, typical death, stroke, non-fatal MI, new renal failure. And you can take a look there and see the comparison between off-pump and on-pump. And in stroke, there is z no statistical difference at all in stroke rate. So I don't get it. So the conclusions of the study were that off-pump was associated with less transfusions and reoperation for bleeding, less acute kidney injury, albeit not statistically significant, less respiratory infections and failure. Okay, that's, that's significant, I think, but it wasn't clinically, it wasn't statistically significant, but that's concerning. We might need to be doing a better job with what we do so that we can reduce that with the pump if we can figure that out. But it was associated with more early revascularizations. Now, this is significant. Your need for another intervention was higher if you had it off pump than if you had it on pump. And that is significant. So it ends up that it's not 
the pump. So now I want you to soak this in, all right? This is sometimes tough to look at, but it's, you know, we're perfusionists and we feel this way pretty much every day, okay? It's just the way it is. So let's talk about TAVR and stroke and how this has created sort of a new awakening with all of this, especially in the sense of TCD. So TAVR for me has certainly opened my eyes to the risk of stroke, something that historically as a perfusionist we worry about but really don't think about um, actively. What's really interesting is that it occurs Heim when you have a question though is how often does it happen? Well, that's just wait till I get to those slides. In fact, our con cerebral embolic um, is free that is really more advanced because of this problem. You now do new TAVR um, clearance for defate, defu post there are locations. Overt paralytic stroke though exists, but type two stroke, new lesion in the brain, lesion about a three mil that equates thousand one. So a lot of these little being three millimeter lesions or a couple of dead brain cells. But I don't know about y'all. And then before the white specks that you see are those lesions and you can see on the, on the, this signing too, you know, are the, are the lesions and see the vessel and you can see where the embolic material is, or whatever it may be, that is occluding the vessel. Uh oh, uh, malfunction. Oh, there it goes. So I want to show you this video. I want to see if anybody notices what I notice about this. This is a this is a tavern going in. They just rapid paste, deployed it. And they come on out. And there goes the wire. What a beautiful procedure. Now, did anybody notice what I noticed the first time that I saw this? Is it's real obvious. I'm gonna play that video one more time. But before you click it, I want you to watch. Everything that you see happening is so smooth and easy. And everything stays in the central lumen of the vessel going around the arch, the wire, the catheter, the, 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 the dialer, the valve, everything stays right in the central lumen. Go ahead and play that one more time for me, Raj. Just let's watch it. Here it goes. A catheter is guided through the femoral artery. Look at how perfect that is. Just kind of dilated everything up. And then they exchange it. There goes the new valve. Look at how pretty that is. There it goes, right 
there. Look, not nothing, not one piece of debris came off that valve. It just trapped it all. Beautiful. Marketing. Smoke and mirrors. It's marketing. If you're a patient and you're sitting in a physician's office and they show you this video and they tell you your other option is they're going to take you to the operating room, they're going to put you to sleep, they're going to wash you up real good, then they're going to make this incision from here to here and take a saw and, and saw your breastbone in half. And then they're going to put a retractor in there and pull it apart. And they're going to put you on this thing called the heart-lung machine, which is probably going to stroke you out. And then they're going to stop your heart. Hopefully, it'll restart. And they're going to replace the valve, then close you up. And hopefully, you'll come off pump. If you don't, they have medicines and sometimes devices. And they're going to take you to the ICU. And, you know, statistically, you're probably going to do fine. But, you know, your mortality rate's going to be, you know, 10%, you know, your stroke rate's going to be, you know, possibly as high as 15% or higher. Or you could have this. <laughs> what are you going to choose? Now, if you're 96 years old or 92 years old and you're a horrible surgical candidate and you're in heart failure and you're miserable and you still have life left and your aorta's, you know, porcelain aorta are so heavily calcified that you know, I mean, uh, there's no way to clamp you. Yeah, I think that there are patients that this is a uh, really great life-altering device to improve quality of life. But, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, please. <clears throat> but it carries with it substantial risk. And I think that's why you're seeing this change in stroke classification, you know, the companies are, they've got, a, I mean, it certainly has utility, but they want to use it in, in patients with less and less contraindications or lower and lower surgical risk patients so that it becomes the go-to first line valve for patients who need aortic valve surgery or aortic valve replacement. And frankly, I, I think that they are doing a disservice. They're business, they wanna make money, I understand all of that. Um, but if, I'm, I, if it's my family member and they're a low to medium surgical risk, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not doing this, just not gonna do it. But that doesn't mean we're out of the woods because there are issues. So. This is what really happens, as you can see. You see in A, what really happens is it goes around and it scrapes that, 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 that superior wall of the aorta and just bangs stuff off and it goes everywhere. And then here you see the valve being deployed or the valve being dilated and it showers stuff. And then you have over here, you see, see all of this going on. So basically, you know, when you take everything out, um, but these showers of calcium and uh, other material, even pieces of the old the valve that you have, been, have been captured in some of these devices that I'm going to show you, end up going to the head vessels. Here it's going to the innominate and eventually the right carotid and then over here the left carotid. So I talked to you about these. This is the Sentinel and uh, I'm going to talk about the study on this. But this device goes in and you flip this one through for the left carotid. You don't worry about the arm. You know, if you get black fingers, they can always just cut those off. But over here, you've got the, uh, the innominate and the, uh, the, the left carotid covered. And then you can remove these. And I want to talk about the, uh, the trial on this, which is pretty encouraging. And they have a couple of other devices, too, which are full nets that go over here. Um, and some interesting stuff that's coming uh, down the pike, uh, still maybe a little bit over the horizon. So this study was done by uh, uh, Dr. Max Group, and I want to go through the study, but I want you to look at this study 
in two ways. One, I think that the information regarding surgical AVR uh, is critically important, and I think that it really tells me we perhaps need to do a little bit better job. But I also want you to think about it from this perspective, sort of the same perspective I did. And listen, I, I, I have tremendous amount of respect for Dr. Mack, a uh, brilliant guy who was one of our award recipients at the uh, New Orleans conference. Um, but he is very uh, passionate about TAVR. He's very passionate about it becoming a, uh, the, one of the first line valves. Um, and I think that uh, he is really trying to advance this technology for all the right reasons, and that is improve patient outcomes. Um, of course, I, I feel like the companies perhaps are at a sort of a little different twist to all of this, but you know, I want to make clear that I think Dr. Mack is a, uh, a, an incredible physician, surgeon, human being, researcher, and uh, he's doing everything he does for the right reasons. However, he is still vested and passionate in his feeling about TAVR. So let's look at it from purely the information about uh, SAVR or surgical aortic valve and also look at it from the perspective of what is this study really trying to prove? So 50,000 patients, plus or minus, undergo surgical AVR in the U.S. each year. The incidence of stroke when examined by a neurologist and, how am I doing on time? Oh, good. And post-operative uh, diffusion-weighted MRI in uh, SAVR patients. So 61% had infarcts or new lesions. 17% had a clinical stroke, what we all know what it is. That's, that's pretty high. Um, but moderate to severe clinical stroke, where they're paralyzed and they're really debilitated, is about 4%. So they have some right or left-sided weakness, um, or they're having some vision impairment, or they're just not thinking real clear right now. Well, those are clinical strokes. But a moderate to severe clinical stroke is that one that we just, oh my God, this is horrible. And that's at about 4%, which is still, still pretty high, being that there's 50,000. This says 50,000. The STS data that I saw recently on the number of procedures, because I had to do a talk and I had to ask them for it, they had the a surgical AVRs at about 35,000, not quite 50. But if you're 4% of gross stroke, uh, that's pretty doggone high, being that the mortality for a cabbage is, you know, one to three tops. So, you know, that's, I think, very significant, um, given the, the, the numbers. So the purpose of the study was to determine the safety and effectiveness of two cerebral embolic protection devices in reducing ischemic uh, CNS injury. The CardioGuard <clears throat> and the old Embolex, which is really fascinating, because this is a fairly recent study, and we can't even get the Embolex anymore. But nevertheless, the CardioGuard is a different device than that Sentinel that I showed you. So in summary in the study, and I'm not going to go through all the stuff from the study, but in summary, um, undergoing SAVR, the use of two different embolic protection devices was not associated with an improvement in freedom from clinical or radiographic uh, infarcts, clinical stroke, overall volume of CNS infarcts by diffusion-weighted MRI, or neurocognitive outcomes in 90 days. <clears throat> That's really surprising to me, especially since it was associated, either device, but again, not the Sentinel device, but these other two devices, the, was associated with the capture of embolic debris in most patients, a reduction in delirium, an observed difference in infarct size distribution, 
Now, I don't know if that's infarct size and distribution or infarct size distribution. I'm assuming just, I, I can't figure that one out, but with fewer, okay, with fewer large volume infarcts, so it's both, and an increase in um, all, uh, 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 all events uh, in the, uh, in the embolex patients, okay, in adverse. An increase in all um, uh, adverse events with embolex patients. And that doesn't even make sense. It captured stuff, but there was an increase in adverse events. Interesting study. So in this study, compelling saga of strokes after Tavra and Saver, diagnostic considerations and uh, neuro ARC. So after TAVR, all patients have brain injury. And here you can see the, 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 the information there. And this is what it looks like. If you look at the image on the top right, and you look at the, the 3D modeling on the, uh, underneath it, you see all of that calcium. Now, if you're surgically removing this, you're going to really clean this out. But if you are doing it with a TAVR and you don't have something to catch that debris, then it's still going to go. But do we, when we're removing it surgically, is it ending up in the ventricle and coming out later? Because our stroke rate's still pretty doggone high. And they are advocating for cerebral and pollock protection devices for surgical AVR as well as for TAVR. So, you know, I've got to tell you, this is, this is really causing me to have more questions than it's really answering things for me. But, you know, hopefully uh, we, can, we can think this through together and come up with some uh, conclusions. So in this particular study here, we, we look and we look at the different trials, severe stroke, major and dis disabling stroke rates range from 1.6 to 5.9%. And there's all of the different studies right here that have been done and kind of what those ranges are. So this is sort of like a, a, a almost like a meta-analysis is what I would call this. Um, mild, moderate, or severe stroke, 15 to 27% 20 by AHA, American Heart Association, ASA uh, definitions. Neurologists identified deficits with new brain MRI lesions, and that's over here, and these are the various studies that were done. But 15 to 20 percent with surgical, these are surgical AVR patients. That's really high. So they looked at this device here, and you've got the different ones. On the left is that Sentinel. This is the Embolex. And over here is the other device. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, it's the other device that I mentioned earlier. Um, and you can, you can look that up. But the trial design considerations were the variation in stroke definitions, because you have these classifications, the uncertainty in diffusion-weighted MRI endpoints, in other words, the frequency versus volumes, um, in these two different trials, variability of the measurements, and what is the clinical relevance? Well, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, every stroke, every stroke is clinically relevant. Maybe not today. Maybe you don't have some obvious effect today. But if I kill a couple hundred thousand of your brain cells tomorrow, the next day, the next year, in five years, what's the effect going to be? I don't think we know that yet. I think everybody assumes reasonably that it's going to have an effect. I'm pretty sure it will, but that's not, I don't know that that study has ever been done. Um, and then performance considerations. Is the device effective and is the device safe? What if you put the device in and 
and, 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 and uh, uh, deploying the device itself causes emboli, then is it safe? I, so I think those are another set of questions that, that, that really do need to be answered. But in this particular study, the use of the Claret Sentinel double filter, which is that thing that I showed you, the Sentinel, where it goes into the innominate and to the uh, left carotid, uh, was associated in this with a high technical success, significantly lower rates of all strokes within seven days, significant lower rate of mortality or stroke within seven days, and by multivariate analysis, the use of this double filter um, was the only significant predictor of patients being stroke-free within seven days and in combination with STS score predictor for stroke-free survival within seven days. So what I want to do is I want to sort of go backwards to the Dr. Mack study. Was that study really about stroke or was that study really about, okay, y'all are saying all this stuff about TAVR and how TAVR causes strokes in all of these patients, but hold on a minute. You do surgery on these patients, you essentially have the same problem. Now, I don't think you really do have exactly the same problem, but I think this Sentinel device is encouraging and I think that as a, in an industry, I think we should sort of look to these CPE or cerebral protection embolic devices and start to maybe understand them a little bit better. Maybe we should be using them for surgical AVR because I think that what you're going to find is surgical AVR where the, you use those devices and you really have an opportunity to debris the area and flush it all out and clear everything off um, before you reestablish flow and then eventually remove those devices is going to significantly reduce the stroke rates in surgical AVR. And my suspicion is it's not going to be a significant benefit in the TAVR population. Again, has to be looked at, has to be studied, but that's my opinion and that's my forecast. So, back to the pump. Not all strokes are caused by the pump. We know that. They need to know that. But the pump is not free of risk. There's hypoperfusion, there's embolic gas or particulate contamination, there's hypocarbia, in fact, if you have a PCO2 of 28, you have a 50% reduction in cerebral blood flow. That's very significant. Um, cannula position, drainage. If you aren't draining the head well, the venous pressure goes up the amount of flow going through the brain reduces and you can actually like reduce it down to nothing depending on how much you occlude the drainage. So you have a heart that's being torqued up, let's say, you're doing an off-pump case and they're doing the, and they're doing the, uh, uh, an OM and they have the heart pulled way up and anesthesia is pumping in Neo and you've got a blood pressure, but do you have blood flow to the brain? Probably not. We know that clamping and unclamping, oh, 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 see, somebody's not telling me to advance my slides. We know that clamping, I'm good now, we know that clamping and unclamping the aorta is an, can be an embolic event. But, is the heart position affecting flow or generating emboli? Do we know if the pump sucker is causing emboli? Do we know if the flow is adequate for, for adequate cerebral perfusion? Do we know if VAD or kinetic assist has an effect on embolic events? Does a dry venous line have an effect? 
Is a closed system better than an open system? When we go down on the flow, does it matter if we turn the rheostat RPM controls down or if we clamp the line and then unclamp the arterial line? Does pulsing have an effect on cerebral blood flow or embolic events? And are our temperature gradients safe? Now, my colleague, Stephanie, who will be back up here at the panel, is pretty confident that my gradients cooling aren't safe. I think they are, but we can argue that point too. Um, the brain is very sensitive to hypoxia. It will auto-regulate, but is affected by, C uh, it will auto-regulate, but is affected by CPP, cerebral uh, perfusion pressure, and CO2. It weighs 1,300 to 1,400 grams consumes 15% of the cardiac output, 50 to 55 mLs per 100 grams of brain matter, and um, has this very conveniently positioned vascular system. Let me tell you a couple of things. Compared to the heart, which only consumes 4 to 5% of the cardiac output, outside of a range of between 60 and 160 millimeters of, auto reg of, of blood pressure, autoregulation to the brain is lost. If you breathe 5% CO2, your cerebral blood flow increases by 50%. If you breathe 7% CO2, so in other words, you become hypercarbic, it increases by 100%. You can, in fact, flood the brain. In acute um, uh, 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 hypocapnia, a delta or a reduction of one to two mLs per minute of, hundred, of, of, per, of blood flow to the brain is associated with a one millimeter mercury drop in PCO2. So one toward drop in PCO2. So from 40 to 39, you're going to lose one to two mLs per 100 grams of brain matter. If your PCO2 is 28, your cerebral blood flow is reduced to be from between 12 to 24 mLs per minute per 100 grams of brain, ma brain, bleh, brain matter. So if you're 50 to 55 per 100 grams and you reduced it to 24 milliliters per 100 grams, you essentially cut it in half having a PCO2 of 28. So when you get your gas back and your PCO2 is 19, you need to fix that pretty quick problematic. So great anatomy, perfectly positioned, and you have this really neat thing, and we talked about this with Dr. Garami, TCD. I won't, I'm not really here to talk about TCD long term. I just kind of want to just touch on it a little bit for the sake of this discussion today, but you have a temporal bone window. Now you can look at it in different ways. You can go under here, you can go through the eyeball. There's all kinds of different ways to do this, but this is the most convenient way going through the temporal bone window. And most of us have that. 10 to 20% of people, especially, uh, I believe it's females uh, that are, I believe, older, I'm not positive, but you know, have an issue. But most people, it's going to work. And you're looking right at the middle cerebral artery on both sides. So you go, one's coming to the probe, so it's red. One's going away from the probe, it's blue. But you can see both channels. You know if there is flow to that brain. Now, on the flip side, you don't know if it's saturated, but you know, you, we are supposed to be looking at the arterial line and the blood's red, so I think we can assume that the flow through there is, in fact, oxygenated blood. That is one of the disadvantages, though, because you're looking at flow, you're not looking at the saturation. But you can't trust the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, what do you call that thing again? The, the uh, cerebral oximeter. You can't trust it. So detection and elimination of microemboli related to cardiopulmonary bypass, study done in circulation. Um, not sure why that was there, but we're going to skip it. TCD, how can a perfusionist be a part of the solution? TCD, newer technology. It's easy to use, has billing codes, which is really good. Uh, can help determine if there was a problem. You may not be able to fix it. Say, well, what good does it know? What good is it to know that this emboli occurred? Well, I'll tell you why it's good to know. One, no one's guessing about what happened. Two, 
um, if every time you do A, B happens, and B is bad, are you going to not change what you're doing with A? Like, I'll give you an example. When we put the aortic cross clamp on, I like to turn the RPMs down. Some perfusionists are just more comfortable clamping the arterial line. Well, if every time I turn the flow controller down or someone else clamps the line and then re releases it or comes back up on the flow, there's emboli, but when you do it a different way, just change it, there isn't any emboli, are you, or, or the number of times you see it is less, are you going to change what you're doing or not? I mean, everybody, w I would. I mean, you know, I think we all would. So, uh, well, I'll get to that point here in just a minute. TCD can be easily adapted to your practice, can be learned by perfusionists, and should become a part of the overall cardiopulmonary bypass tool set, if you will. Um, and of course, I think we need to become more involved and know better what has happened um, to our patients. And I think that this study says it all, or this, I'm sorry, this quote, and then I'll tell you about the, the study. Is it better to know or not know? There are known knowns. These are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. These are things we don't know that we don't know. Don Rumsfeld. Man, I, I'm still wrapping myself around that, but it's a good point. When we do a type 1 dissection and you're choosing to use antegrade through the axillary and it's acute, how do you know you're flowing enough through the brain? You use cerebral oximetry? Yeah. You're going to go deep hypothermia, circulatory arrest, and you're going to just have a little bit of flow going up through the brain. What are you going to use? Cerebral, I mean, I'll think cerebral oximetry is going to work it. You know, I mean, I already showed you, you can, you know, we can kill you and take your brain out and still have a number either way. So how do you know you're flowing? If you put it in retrograde, uh, you can depend on seeing it coming back up through the arch vessels. So that's kind of a validation. Um, if you uh, talk to Dr. Karami uh, with his, ex his previous experience studying antegrade versus retrograde isolated cerebral perfusion, he will tell you that retrograde is by far superior. But if you go look at the data that's published, really, I mean, by, by evidence-based standards, antegrade is really the way to go. But it's one of those things that we don't know what we don't know if we're not measuring it. So regardless of which one you choose initially, if there's no flow and you're going to be doing this incredible type 1 dissection, which we all hate, and the patient survives it only to find out that they had a big stroke, brain dead, whatever, from lack of, from hypoperfusion, when we could solve that problem very easily by having that device on. So for those of you who don't know Dr. Garami, this is him. He's also, uh, he's kind of, uh, he's a really, <coughs> really nice guy, but I think that's actually Homer Simpson's skull, but his brain really is bigger than that. But if, you know, nevertheless, he wants cerebral oximetry. I want to show you these devices before we get to the panel. There is, well, we'll go to an advertisement, I think. This is what a typical head frame looks like. Now, what does everybody see as the number one limiting factor to cerebral oximetry? Everything, do you see what I see? Because I'm going to show you what it is. Let's look at a patient. There's a patient. Okay, now, patient's 
you know, obviously you sleep. What do you see as the problem in the operating room? There's not a whole lot of real estate in the head anyway, the forehead. You put this thing on and they want, anesthesia wants their BIS monitor. You need to be in there to make sure that these, this probe is focused where it needs to be. And so that you have a good view of the middle cerebral artery. And um, so there's a lot going on here, which makes it tough in an operative environment, unless you have strong support of anesthesia. And really, you need to have really, strong, this is great for the ICU too, patients that are on ECMO. Um, but you really need to have uh, uh, the surgeon who is responsible for the procedure and anesthesia on board with wanting to do this. But there is no question in my mind that the only true mechanism for confirming adequacy of cerebral perfusion is this device. It's all there is. And I think that you know, I'm going to show you some devices. They're coming up with new ones. So it's taking off. It is going to take off. But you can also, and I think you can have fun with it too. All right. So uh, here is, uh, here is um, uh, Bill. Bill, is it Mark? I forgot how you say his name. Bill. Ah, I forgot Bill's name. Whatever. So, uh, but here he is at one of our conferences and he's doing that. Now you can, what you can also study with it is, if you drink, your cerebral oximetry numbers change. So here we are all drinking, and, uh, and that was a really good, uh, a good study. But here is the device that I'm talking about. Now, this is very automated. It's made by a company, Neural Analytics. And this is a cerebral, this is a, uh, a transcranial Doppler device. Um, it's pretty bulky. I think it's going to be a tough sell. Um, in its current state, uh, but it comes with, let's see if they, uh, I have some additional pictures. There's the monitor that comes with it, uh, and it looks like it's Bluetooth, which is really beneficial, and uh, I guess it doesn't really show just the frame. I wished I had that on here. I, I, I must have not added that slide, but it's kind of the head just goes in a cradle, and everything just sort of aligns, you know, very simply, but intraoperatively doing a heart with, uh, with, with, you know, patient that's, you know, on the ET tube, uh, you know, being under general anesthesia, I think that's going to be a real tough sell. So it's going to have to get smaller and more automated um, and uh, be perhaps a little easier to use. But interpreting the waveforms and understanding what all of the information that this thing is telling us means, I think is right in the perfusionist wheelhouse. And uh, I think that, uh, did I mess something up? I'm sorry, here, I got it, there. What did I do, Roger, I messed up. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, okay. I'm sorry, everybody, I, I'm clicking two things at once, and that, again, I'm a perfusionist, you know, it's complicated. Um, but, uh, but I think that this technology is going to continue to advance. And I think as perfusionists, I think that it has the, oppor the real opportunity to change how we practice to help us to be better perfusionists and to also um, make the pump safer and more less frightening to physicians who don't really understand what we do and to patients, which overall is going to benefit our profession, I think. So with that said, I'm going to go to commercial break and then we're going to come back and Stephanie and Min are going to join me and we're going to talk about stroke, perfusion technique, TCD, TAVR, SAVR, how we feel about all of this. And, and welcome back to the show, everybody. We have two, we have our, our esteemed panel back with us now. We have Stephanie Ebus and Min Tran, both perfusionists extraordinaires. Hmm. And I don't know if you noticed this or not, but we have a 
you know, we have a new background, okay, for the studio. If you remember from previous webinars, there was just like a black hole back there. Now look, there it is right there. I can see myself now. And, uh, and, and you see the, the pulse going across earlier. We had a great backdrop, but, um, but Stephanie is, uh, is not happy with it. And uh, she loves the pulse, but she says, I have to have the skyline behind me. So Roger, could we go ahead and go back to the skyline and then let's focus in, zoom in. I said on, for one picture. And zoom in on Stephanie and be serious, okay? You have okay. to have a serious look and look I got at the, it. which camera does she need to be uh, looking uh, at? Right here. This camera right serious here. Serious or smiling? Well, I mean, just well, both. You know, okay. you could be. Oh, okay. I mean, you could. Yeah. Uh, that's that? good. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Okay, moving on, moving on. Okay, moving on. Okay, so, uh, so, so, uh, I, Scorpio Ray, which is Ray Kubiak, okay, I've made it a habit to ask the surgeon about the previous patient. Be, been doing that since I've been a perfusionist, and it is probably due to my dad's and uncle's poor brain function after heart surgery. That's interesting, you know, Ray. I mean, I don't know what kind of, I'm assuming they had cabbages. I don't know when it was, um, when the procedure was done. Um, I mean, you're, you're, I'm not saying you're old, but you're not a young man either. And, you know, you've probably been, uh, that was probably a while ago. I don't know, bubble oxygenators uh, possibly. And then Jennifer says that my issue with TAVR has always been the patients aren't surgical candidates right up until something goes wrong mm -hmm. and then they are suddenly emergency surgery candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, great, a great question. question. So let's just, and Ray, I'm gonna, I want to come to the, that, that issue about what we do in terms of knowing, because I'm, I'm, I really compliment you on checking on your patients, regardless of how we do it. Asking, it doesn't make any difference. Go see them however you want to do it. But um, uh, let's, I, I want to really hit that because that is such a good point about the, uh, patients aren't surgical candidates. They have to have TAVR until something has gone horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, you know, uh, John was just on with us. Yes. They're doing about 300 TAVRs a year there. They are no longer just doing non- 300? They're no longer just doing high risk non-surgical candidates. They are doing moderate to low risk. Yes. But I also if, know- if you, needed to, if you needed an aortic valve right now for, you know, uh, you had a bicuspid valve and you needed to have a valve, uh, not calcific disease, you know, you're too young. What would you do? Well. I know the risk, so I would go to surgery and get a valve and get it done right. Um, you know, the rule for TAVR is right now three valves. So if you get one when you're 40, you basically can get a valve and a valve and a valve, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So longevity-wise, and uh, I just... And each one's going to be smaller. Yeah, you're just going to keep getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Ben, what do you called? think? I would also, uh, I agree with... Hello Stephanie. there, you're on the air. No, you go ahead. Hi, Min's, Joe. Hey, hey, Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Joe. It's Jennifer Warner. How you doing? Good, good. Hold on. So, Min's going to make Min's going to make a point here, and then we'll just stay on the line, okay? But go ahead. Absolutely. Min. I was just going to say that um, I agree with Stephanie. I would definitely want to have a uh, surgical procedure done. Um, there's just too many risks um, and contraindications for what can happen with uh, a TAVR versus getting direct, um, you know, uh, valve done. And I know that the longevity of those procedures would probably outweigh the the risk that I would I may I may incur with the tabers. Mm -hmm. But we know the facts. The Most facts, people yeah. don't. Right now, on the flip side, I was talking to someone just the other day, and I'm trying to remember who it was I was talking to. I was on the phone with them, and we were on, we were on this topic of taver, and I said something about I wouldn't have it, you know, and they said, well, you know. My dad's 92, and he was, you know, he just had it done, and he did great. I still do think that that's appropriate. I think I that is appropriate. Then. 92 years old. You have to be you the know. right candidate for it. I think okay. you got to be the right candidate for it. Jennifer, what, what, what do you think? Well, I'm on the delay, so I'm just coming into this. But, yeah, that's been my point. It started out 
you know, it was non-surgical. It was the patients they had to select Mm-hmm. were not, they, they were, you're, you're 95 years old, you've got poor splint aorta, and you're never going to have this redone. Um, and now it's more elective. It's these patients mm-hmm. that could have surgery, they just opt not to. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of hybrid ORs that, gosh, they're new, they're only five, six years old, and they built these hybrid ORs just for TAVARs. Mm-hmm. And at first we were on standby. We had a wet pump in the room, we were in there with them, and then they decided that cost too much money. Um, so now they're doing them down in the cath lab uh, without any pump standby at all whatsoever because they just figure, well, if we have to do surgery, we'll just bring them upstairs. You, you um, know, one reason for that is because if you do it in the cath lab, the cardiologist can um, schedule a case. If you do it in a hybrid OR room, it has to be a surgeon that schedules the case. But I thought that, in, and, and if anybody knows this for sure, I thought that you had to have both a cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon in, scrubbed in for the procedure or CMS will not pay for it. You can do it, but CMS will not pay. And that's what and I thought. And we always have a cardiac was. surgeon. You uh, have one of our surgeons surgeon is always there. Always yeah. there. Yeah. Yes, okay, but that's why. But not the team now? I'm pardon? So the cardiac surgeon is still there, but the team isn't? No perfusion. Yeah. No perfusion? No, mm-hmm. yeah, the, it's just, it's cath lab staff, uh, the interventional cardiologist, and a cardiac surgeon uh, mm-hmm. is always there to do them. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, there's no backup team whatsoever. And I guess they just figure, well, if something goes wrong, we'll rush them upstairs. Because, you know, an unstable um, non-surgical candidate is suddenly at, uh, rushed to come up an elevator down the hallway and into an OR that isn't prepared for them. Mm-hmm. How, let me ask and, you if I can, how many years have you been at that particular institution doing this? Five years. Five years. So, and now how long, so five years of doing TAVR? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I did TAVRs at another institution okay. for a couple of years. Uh huh. So, on average, in a one year span, how many cases? did you have to rush from the either put the patient on pump in the hybrid room or rush from the cath lab to the operating room? To be honest, I don't think I personally have done it yet. I think we've had a couple of close calls where we got the phone call, oh, they're going to come upstairs, something's gone wrong. And then a few minutes later, it's like, no, no, wait, they, uh, they fixed it, we're good. Um, okay. And I'm wondering, for as long as these have been out, and since they are doing younger patients that are surgical candidates, what is the redo factor on these? Um, well, that, what's going to happen we when talking. you have to go back in and you've now got a native valve with a stented valve squished in the middle of it, mm-hmm. and they have to go in and redo it? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, Stephanie actually, uh, you want to articulate that again? The, she just came back from a meeting um, you went to the uh, Sanibel meeting and mm-hmm. they were, and you're finding, one of the things that I think you're, you told me was that uh, you're hearing a lot about ECMO and TAVR and ECMO and TAVR and, mm-hmm. and, and what were they saying about that at that, do uh, you know who gave the talk? Well, it wasn't a talk. I, I asked the rep when I was watching the TAVR, okay. how many valves can you put in because so watching a TAVR, you were... Watching a TAVR, I was just asking a rep. Oh, not at the meeting. Not at the meeting. Okay. And um, they said the, it's three is the max. So, and I was asking that because the valve didn't get deployed right, correctly, and they needed to put another valve in. So immediately that patient already ended up with two valves. Oh my God. And then I said, well, what is Can the you max? That? No. And then Can they you said three. imagine being like, oh, you got your native valve. You've got one, one valve. Place, and we put one on the good spot. Like you're fine now. Right. Yeah. And I've only seen, I've actually done one redo case where we had somebody had a, um, they had a, a transmitral done. Mm-hmm. And uh, it got infected, something went wrong, and they had to go and replace it. And I, I have pictures of it somewhere of this, of this stented mitral valve being taken out and having to redo it with another mitral uh, surgically. Wow. How long did that take? Oh, that was a lie. I don't remember. That was a pretty long case, but it was mm-hmm. interesting to see this stented valve get removed and the amount of 
tissue around it they had to take mm -hmm. and you know the opening you're left with of course is a gaping hole you've got to put a gigantic valve in I mean, look, and I mean, you're did still, the, did you're the still patient, worried about squishing the aortic yeah, did mm -hmm. the patient survive yes they did no, that's good I'm, i mean they're lucky i mean really that's a you know uh, i mean there's a lot you know you think about the you know there's not a lot of space in there, you know, no. where the mitral and the aortic is. I mean, you know, we're not surgeons, but, you know, we, 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 you know, we kind of look around and see what's going on. And, you know, we've got that project coming up. Jennifer, you're going to like to hear this. We've got a project that we're working on. Um, and it was uh, actually Patrick, uh, his, his idea, and Roger. Um, we have GoPro cameras on the pump from every angle. So you see the roller pumps, you see the flow controller, you see the reservoir and centrifugal, you see the, uh, the uh, what do you call that, the data panel. We use the S5, so it's the data panel. And then a camera on the actual operative field, all cameras synced simultaneously. So you'll be able to see, like when the aortic valves are the best. I mean, the views you get with that are just incredible. But, uh, but, you know, I, I think that when you watch these cases, and I think that that's going to be a good example, it's really surprising how, how limited your, your room for error is when you're doing a mitral or you're doing an aortic and how it affects the other valve. You know, it's, 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 you know, we think of it, I think, as kind of like, I mean, sometimes I think about it as like a, 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 a Lycoming IO540. You know, you pull it out, you know, you take the jug off and you open up the crankcase and, you know, it's pretty easy to work on. Mm -hmm. But the heart's really complicated. And I wonder yeah. about these, these, these procedures where we're putting these things in catheter catheter based, but I guess that's the way of the world. I mean, I think everything is wanting to get smaller. Everything is wanting to be done <clears throat> without traditional surgery. <clears throat> Patients are demanding it. And uh, I don't know, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, and you've probably seen a lot of these, um, you know, the, the elective tavers that are of non um, elderly patients who can have a regular surgical intervention done. Um, decide not to just because, um, you know, there's no, there's no surgical wound, um, you know. Well, did you think yeah. I was unfair when I described what I did? Jennifer, did you think you were men or Stephanie? Did you think I was unfair at the way I categorized what the company, one of the companies who manufactures these tavers, what their marketing material looked like that patients basically are going to look at? Right. Well, no. Do you think I was, do you think I was unfair? That's I think that anything can be uh, animated in a very pleasant way. Mm -hmm. um, everything can be made to look, as, and they want to keep it simple. I mean, you, you, you don't want a complicated one where you go, well, we could do this. We could perf your femoral. You know, we mm -hmm. could poke you here. We could dissect your LAD. We, you know, they don't want to see. They just want to see the basics of how it works. And, of course, they're going to make it look beautiful. Very um, of course. So, but uh, anybody, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. You know, and we know we know to do that. We know to ask the questions and to point out to, to look for the flaws. Mm -hmm. Not everybody does. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did enjoy your presentation, mm -hmm. by the way. Which one? Oh, the one on the one stroke? you just gave. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. I, I did appreciate a really that. good job, and it it really brought a lot to light for me because. That is one of my arguments to people, the stroke rate of mm. TAVERS. And TAVERS for you, have a high stroke rate. It does, but for, for right. you to bring yeah. up that we are seeing that in our <laughs> surgical patients also, it, it really right. brought, it opened my eyes that there's a lot more that we can do. Right. Well, I, you know, I agree. You know, I, I thought that as well, Joe. You. I really appreciated your presentation. And what I found interesting is I'm a big proponent of cerebral oximetry use. Um, I've been doing it since way back in the day, mm -hmm. um, and I've seen the different devices, and, you know, I have my preference, and we just recently switched to a new device, and uh, I'm not a fan, and I understand what you say when they're all different. They all have some voodoo in the box that uh, takes these numbers and then plops you out a number, and everyone's going to tell you that theirs is the best, mm -hmm. and this is why, and they all cite some study that's 15 years old um, that they're just clinging to 
But in the meantime, like you said, they've changed their technology. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to throw names out there, but I apologize. But, like, oh, you know, Kazmed is one of them. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, Kazmed's claim to fame was, we use lasers, we use lasers. Ours is better because we use lasers. Right. Right. And then they said, you know what, the lasers aren't that great. <laughs> and so they went, they went to NEARS, which is right. what everybody else uses. <clears throat> exactly. So now you're telling me you're still great and you're still better, but you're using the same technology as everybody else. So where did, like, what, what are you talking about? Right, I, I agree. And if I, and if I hear the word absolute number one more time, I'm going to smack the money in the <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yes. Well, you know it what? Means, it means absolutely nothing, and it drives me crazy. You only need to show them two slides. One is the one that I showed you of the, you know, I guess, I guess what you could call it is patient or pumpkin. Um, so you stick it on a pumpkin, you're going to get a, a, a reading. Um, and then immediately after that one, show them the, uh, the, uh, the elephants. So I think those two slides juxtaposed to each other is probably the best um, uh, visual of my opinion about all of these companies and how they market their material and tell us, you know, how great everything is and how perfect everything is and how this is going to save your patient and this and that. The other thing, and you know, look, I mean, I think without true randomized control, double blind prospective studies mm -hmm. that you know, are, are the highest level of, of, of evidence-based medicine. Um, I, I don't think any of this really makes any sense. Now, I'll argue my own point and say that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So just because no study proves something doesn't mean that it's not, in fact, the case. So anecdotal evidence is clearly very important. And, you know, at the end of the day, we all want to feel good about what we do. My opinion, though, Jennifer, is, is that cerebral oximetry is um, inherently unreliable, and, it, and I think you like it and are using it because it makes you feel better, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I like to feel better, too, uh, but I think that if we don't start seriously considering using transcranial Doppler, I'm afraid that every single company out there is work except for the companies that make and even they are that make cardiopulmonary uh, materials that we use disposables consumables that we use is working diligently towards eliminating the need for the heart lung machine and the perfusionist pretty much in every possible way so I, I think that it's our responsibility to try to figure out how we can reduce our own stroke rates, and I think that can only be done well, uh, with uh, with something that's more more precise. Hold, hold on, hold on there, Joe. Back that up a second. Um, <laughs> I would like to say that you know using cerebral oximetry isn't just a matter of making me feel better. This is not just my security blanket. Um, <laughs> we have to use the technology available to the best of our ability that we can. And as new technology comes out, such as PCB, we need to find a way to incorporate it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we should be doing, is always testing our science, always looking at what we're doing and why we're doing it, and ask, does it still work for us? Too many perfusionists are this, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, and, but, they're mean, not, but they don't want to hear it's broke. So yes, I use cerebral oximetry, and I, I try to keep up with you know, how, I, how it's changed how I pump cases over the years. I mean, I remember Back when I was a student, I mean, there was a surgeon I worked with. As soon as the cross clamp went on, you dropped to a 1.8 index. That's it. You were 2, 4, 1, 8. That was it. Right. Um, obviously, I don't do that anymore. Yes, I run my CO2 differently now. I run my CO2 higher, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, because of what I've seen happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm always trying to incorporate my techniques. So I don't necessarily think it's just a security blanket. Oh, it's a number that makes me feel good. Um, I, I try very hard to look at am I doing this to the best of my ability? Am I using what's available to me? And I'm relying on people to do studies and mm -hmm. take a look at what's happening. Um, and as new things come out, I mean, you mentioned TCD measures flow, but okay, is it saturated flow? How much of it's being up, to, uh, is it is getting taken up and being used? Or just because blood mm -hmm. flow is going there doesn't mean the organ's using any of it. So you have to look at more than just one facet of it. I mentioned that we do PPE cases. We do 200 PPE cases a year. That's a um, lot. That's a lot. a lot. And they're, they're all big circle rest cases, and we've got them down to a science. Uh, but we use EEG, and that's our, you know, we have a baseline. We crash cool, you know, we circle rest, we reperfuse, we circle rest, we reperfuse back and forth, and we warm. And we make sure that the EEG 
um, is baseline. You know, that's the best we can do. The best we can say is we started at A and we ended at A. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not that means anything, I don't know. But for what we have to work with, mm -hmm. it's the best we have at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think, and that's a fair point. And, 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 you know, and I certainly, I'm glad that um, uh, what I said got you riled up because I, I really like to hear, you know, people's opinions, especially when they're strong. But at the same time, I have to, you know, in all fairness, tell you that I, you know, fundamentally disagree with, with, the, uh, with the idea that cerebral oximetry provides truly useful data. I think that it can and does on some cases, but my concern is, is that for those cases that it does provide good information on, are we, ex are we assuming, and I believe very wrongly, that there are cases that it is not providing accurate information on, and we believe that the information that's coming to us is actually accurate, so we're not making an intervention or when we should, or we are making an intervention when we don't really need to. And anytime you make any intervention, you certainly want it to be the right thing to do. So my view is that it's not good data. I, I, I don't well, like I, I absolutely, un I totally understand what you're saying. And, and that's one of those things that any science you apply to this, there's going to be outliers. There's going to be times that it really does help and times when maybe it doesn't. The question is, do you throw out the times when it does help just because there are times when it doesn't? I mean, you talk about we you did the yeah. transonic flow the other time. Yeah. And obviously the surgeon was talking about, he was showing you these very obvious cases where here's where a graft really wasn't good and we knew it wasn't good because of this and now we were mm -hmm. able to fix it. And he even said, you know, most of the time you're going to have good numbers. Mm. So do you not use it because you figure most of the time you're going to be fine anyway? Mm. No, mm. you use it on all of them to verify all of them. No, I can't guarantee that every case is going to be perfect information, perfect placement. Believe me, I fight with anesthesia all the frickin' time. They are notorious for putting the sensors on wrong. Not mm. difficult, and they put them on frickin' backwards. They don't like the way the cables lay, so they invert one of the sensors on the left side of the head. Mm. And I'm constantly shaking them saying, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Like you are changing where the nearest is coming in, you're changing where the sensors are picking it up, and you're going to cause artifacts. I can't guarantee I'm getting good information if you're not using it properly. Yes. Um, but the best I can do is try. The best I can do is say, look, you know, I have this information. I used it the way I was supposed to. That's, that's all I can do. And well, obviously now, we'll keep looking at it and keep changing and doing better things in that over time. In that regard, Jennifer, and I'd like you guys to jump in. I want you guys to, to get involved in this too. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna zoop, zip it up for just a few minutes and let you do it. But I will tell you this: I do compliment you. I talked. I uh, 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 Ray um, complimented him. Uh, John from up in uh, up in uh, Columbus. Uh, uh, Columbus, Ohio, complimented him. So I want to compliment you personally as well, because I know you are at least trying to do the right thing. And one of the things that is a real sore spot for me is this whole concept of, you know, is this not also our patient? Is what we do just a job? Is it a profession? What's our responsibility? Are we just knob turners? Are we perfusionists? Are we you know, what is, what is, what should be our involvement and participation? And of course, people that have other, whether it be us personally or who we're, surgeon we're working with, hospital where we're working, anesthesia we're working with, they can feel completely differently. I don't want you to talk. I don't even want to know who you are. Others are like, hey, what do you think about this? There's just, it runs the gamut, and I'm kind of curious about that. But I do want to compliment you. At least you care. And that means more to me than pretty much anything else. You guys want to well, I get think, some thoughts out there? Uh, my takeaway point from her is that it doesn't have to be an exact number. She can use it as a trending device. And 
I think it's been very effective for that. Mm -hmm. And I actually want to compliment you too because it's very hard to argue Joe once he's uh, <laughs> once he's firm on a point and you did a great job. So if you ever want to come on again and do a talk, we would love to have you. Uh, thank you. I've, I've been to several of the New Orleans meetings, including the very first one. So Joe and I have been arguing for years now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put we can that, tell. We we'll can put tell. that to use and come on yeah, our exactly. show. <laughs>